Hello and welcome to Random Interesting Facts, the podcast about everything and nothing, with your host, 42. This week's topic is sharks. So let's dive right in with fact number one. But let's not dive too deep lest we get bitten by a shark. Great white sharks grow up to 100,000 teeth in a single lifetime. Have you ever wished you never had to brush your teeth again because if one just fell out, you'd simply grow a new one in its place? Well then, you better wish that you wake up as a shark the next time you blow out your birthday candles because sharks have 99 problems, but tooth decay ain't one. That's because a shark's gnashes have built-in obsolescence. Unlike humans, sharks keep producing teeth the entirety of their lives. Great white sharks have around 50 teeth in their jaws, with a few more in the upper than the lower. These serrated triangular teeth can reach up to six and a half inches in height, and they fall out frequently. But that doesn't matter to the shark, because behind the front row of exposed teeth, they have five-ish rows of fresh reserve teeth. That's around 300 teeth in total, each one ready to replace any that fall in marine-based battle. And shark teeth fall out a lot. They don't have roots, and they're embedded in soft cartilage, so there isn't much to keep them in place. A shark's upper jaw is separate from the skull, attached instead by ligaments, a feature they only share with lampreys, which, if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting one, is an eel-like fish that looks like a bumhole with teeth. Yeah. This unique design feature means lampreys and sharks alike can thrust their entire mouths forward and open them frighteningly wide when attacking. Some species of shark do a rapid grab and then shake their prey vigorously, using their razor-sharp teeth to separate tissue from bone. You know, just like your grandma does when she attacks a turkey leg with her dentures. Despite the softness of their cartilage, they have powerful jaw muscles. The Great White has the world's second strongest chomp after the saltwater crocodile. A great white can eviscerate you with 4,000 pounds per square inch of biting force. To put that into perspective, that's 17 times stronger than a pit bull's bite. So with all that tearing flesh off prey, taking chunks out of each other on a whim, and giving boat hulls an opportunistic nip, a tooth can fall out in as little as a week. But that really is no big deal to a shark, because a new one can be in place within an hour. Given how frequently they lose teeth, their limitless supply, and the fact that great white sharks can live to around 70, it's recently been estimated that they could get through 100,000 teeth in a lifetime. Which begs the question, given what a pain toothache is, and the fact human life expectancy is longer than a shark's, why don't we have a few teeth on reserve? I'd certainly appreciate a spare molar or two. Our teeth may look different from a shark's, but structurally they're very similar, with an inner layer of dentine covered by an extremely hard outer layer. In the case of humans, that's enamel. In sharks, it's a harder version of dentine called enameloid or dorodentin. Recent research has shown that exactly the same genes control tooth growth in sharks and humans. Great, so there's really no reason why we can't have dentine superpowers too. Or is there? Well, the reason we humans aren't as orally blessed as sharks is because of our diet. We're omnivores and need five distinct types of teeth for different functions, these being incisors, canines, premolars, molars and third molars. Well, that last one seems to spend its life just pissing me off, but anyway. Sharks have only one tooth shape, the really sharp and pointy kind. 
So it would require some really clever genes to grow and organize five different types of spare teeth. However, some reptiles with similarly complex oral furniture, such as crocodiles, do grow new teeth, a new set each year in fact. And they have incisors, canines and molars. X-rays have shown that crocodile tooth enamel is much thinner than ours. So if they didn't get a new set each year, there'd be a lot more crocodiles with toothache. But that might also be why they can grow new ones, because it's so thin. Thick enamel takes a long time to develop. Some mammals compensate for tooth damage in other ways. Rabbits and other rodents teeth never stop growing to counter the erosion that comes with constant gnawing. But this neat little trick comes with the issue of overgrowth if they're in captivity and are unable to wear their teeth down fast enough. Scientists have found that the secret to sharks' continuous tooth regeneration lies within the cells in their epithelial or outer layer in their mouths. In this layer are pockets of stem cells called dental lamina, which remain active throughout the shark's life. Humans also have dental lamina, but after producing two sets of teeth, they undergo apoptosis, which is a fancy way of selling your cells die. Recently, scientists have discovered that humans retain a small number of proliferating tooth stem cells similar to those that remain active in sharks, which means if they can unlock our tooth proliferating potential through studying sharks' genes, we might one day be growing new teeth instead of slapping a costly crown on top of a broken one. I'm not sure I'd welcome all the dribbling and crying that goes with teething, though, especially if I had to deal with it 100,000 times over. But having shiny new teeth whenever I need it does sound appealing. Next up, moment from history. Where each week we look back at one particularly odd moment from the past. In this episode, we go back to the 2nd of July, 1982. When Larry Walters attached 42 helium-filled balloons to his lawn chair and flew 16,000 feet above Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. You know that childhood wish that you had where you see a bunch of balloons at a fairground and imagine you could be carried away up into the sky like Mary Poppins and over the rooftops. No, me neither. My childhood dream was to catch a real Pokemon. But for Vietnam veteran Larry Walters, going sky high at the behest of some latex and helium was his dream. Actually, it was more like his life's ambition because his dream came true. Schoolboy Larry's hopes of being a pilot were thwarted by poor eyesight, and from a young age, he'd been on the lookout for an alternative. He encountered a helium-filled weather balloon in an army surplus store, and began to experiment with creating hydrogen gas in the hopes of giving himself a boost one day. If he'd taken these hydrogen-based experiments further, there's a high chance his dreams would have ended abruptly. There's a reason you can't buy hydrogen balloons for parties. It has an awkward tendency to violently explode. Instead, he turned to helium, a nice inert gas that doesn't explode even when you poke it with a flame, which is always reassuring. Many years later, at the age of 32, he finally achieved his goal with the help of his girlfriend, Carol Van Doysen who took on debts of $14,000 to get things off the ground. Literally. The final scheme was distinctly half-baked. As a concession to her safety worries, he did do a single parachute jump and bought a parachute for an emergency, but without really understanding how he'd be able to deploy it if he needed to. Nevertheless, on the 1st of July 1982, he announced to Carol's mother that he was going to launch his unlicensed aircraft from her back garden in San Pedro, California. 
Naturally, this made her a little nervous, but they went ahead anyway. He and Carol spent all night inflating 42 weather balloons with helium from 55 cylinders and tied them into four clusters above the flying machine Larry named Inspiration. Inspiration was, in fact, a Sears Roebuck lawn chair, a simple piece of garden furniture with a webbed seat and a metal frame. Nice and light for flying, I suppose. At one point during the night, local police grew curious about the now 100-foot-high stack of 7-foot-wide balloons and asked them what they were doing. Larry said they were filming a commercial, which satisfied the cops. Carol later said she'd wanted to make the flight too, but a lack of a second armchair prevented her. Yeah, sure, Carol. Being one armchair down is the only decent excuse not to strap yourself to possibly the most doomed aircraft since the Hindenburg. On the 2nd of July, with everything nearly in place, it occurred to Larry's friends that he might land in the Pacific. So they ran to a local marine store to buy him a life jacket. His other equipment consisted of a citizen's band two-way radio, an altimeter, a compass, a flashlight, spare batteries, a medical kit, a pocket knife, beef jerky, a road map of California, a camera, two liters of Coca-Cola, about 35 gallons of water in plastic bottles tied to the sides of the chair to act as a ballast, a parachute, and a pellet gun for popping balloons when he wanted to descend. He didn't bother with a seatbelt as the seat of the chair tilted back slightly, so he didn't feel he'd be in danger of falling out. With Larry in place and the chair tethered to a friend's jeep, they began cutting the guy ropes attached to the balloons, ready for him to take off. He said afterwards that he'd only intended to fly about 100 feet off the ground. Instead, the balloon shot up so fast they broke the tether, and he rose at around 1,000 feet a minute, quickly breaking through the clouds. In the rush, his glasses fell off. There's a recording of his radio conversation with Carol, with her begging him to come back down, and with him reassuring her that he had a spare pair of glasses and was fine, and was simply heading for a bit of a foggy patch. As he continued to rise, the temperature dropped, and at around 15,000 feet, he popped six or seven balloons with his pellet gun. He'd have popped more, but the chair tipped, and the gun slipped out of his hands. It wasn't tied to the chair, so he had to watch it shrink to a dot as it fell back to earth. It was never found, so hopefully it didn't hit anyone on impact. Airship inspiration was still rising, and Larry was having to breathe hard to get enough oxygen. He later learnt that if he hadn't managed to pop those few balloons, he most likely would have kept rising to 50,000 feet and turned into an ice block. Instead, he was spotted by a commercial pilot who reported him to air traffic control. This is TWA-231. Level at 16,000 feet. We have a man in a chair attached to balloons in our 10 o'clock position. Range, five miles. Yeah, not exactly an obstacle they teach you to deal with in flight school. Luckily for Larry, now the balloons began to deflate. And on his way back down, at 13,000 feet, air traffic control got in touch, wanting to know where he'd flown from. Larry told them, my point of departure was 1633 West 7th Street, San Pedro. To which their response was, Say again the name of that airport? At around 2,000 feet above the ground, the armchair began to plummet. Larry had to slash the water-filled ballast bottles to slow his descent. His flight ended with him scraping a rooftop and dangling from power cables. He was lucky not to have smashed into the ground, or been electrocuted. He was charged with operating a civil aircraft for which there is not currently an airworthiness certificate. Yeah, that about sums it up. And he was fined $4,000.
which was later reduced to 1,500. His story made the front page news of the New York Times, featured in TV news bulletins, and he became a motivational speaker, known as Lawn Chair Larry. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum tried to acquire the chair for their permanent collection, but he'd already given it away to a kid on the street when he landed. Sadly, like many who achieved their lifelong dreams too soon, Larry doesn't seem to have coped well with the loss of purpose, and in 1993, he took his own life, dying of a gunshot wound to the heart in a tent in Angeles National Forest. But Larry's tale of man versus gravity is not forgotten. His story has inspired novelists, film directors, and plot lines in TV shows. And his was the first urban legend TV show Mythbusters confirmed to be true. Now, we'll take a quick break, and soon we'll be back with fact number two. Fact number two. Sharks can sense electromagnetic fields. One of the reasons we find sharks so terrifying is that despite being nearly blind, they have an insane ability to track things down. Actually, I think it's mostly their teeth, but it certainly doesn't help. The movie trope of a shark smelling a few drops of blood several miles away and making a beeline for it well, a shark line, is deeply embedded in our psyche. In reality, that trope is usually exaggerated for cinema. A shark's sense of smell is actually similar to other fish, which still means it's pretty good, but probably not keen enough to detect your blood from a mile away. Although they can detect smells up to one part per 10 billion, depending on the shark and what they're smelling which is still bloody impressive, and a great white could certainly smell one drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, for example. But a shark's bloodhound-esque abilities aren't what makes it one of Mother Nature's deadliest predators. Believe it or not, sharks can hunt you down, whether you're bleeding or not. Because they can sense your electromagnetic field. I'm aware that makes them sound like some kind of slippery underwater X-Men, but it's true. They accomplish this via a gel-like substance inside the pores of their snouts. As all living animals generate a weak electric field, these pores, called ampullae of Lorenzini, are able to sense that field and help sharks to pinpoint their prey. Sharks aren't the only animals that have this electroreceptive sixth sense, but land-going predators can't use it to hunt as they're missing a crucial ingredient, seawater. The air surrounding land animals acts as an insulator, so predators can't detect their prey's bioelectric field. Air only conducts electricity if it becomes ionized which only really happens during a thunderstorm. Fresh water isn't a good conductor either, though throw enough voltage at it by, say, dropping your charging cell phone in the bath, and this'll certainly do the job. Seawater, on the other hand, is a very good conductor. Due to the presence of salt, or sodium chloride, which, when in water, separates into sodium ions that lack an electron and are positively charged, and chlorine ions, that have an extra electron and are negatively charged. So when fish and other organisms move, their muscles contract, creating a faint electrical charge which is transferred to the seawater. Sharks are ultra-electrosensitive. If you dropped a lit flashlight powered by two AA batteries in the water, a shark 1,000 miles away would know about it. Yeah, 1,000 miles away. I can't even detect when I left the TV on downstairs. Sharks use their electromagnetic ability in other ways too. 
Just like many birds, and even dogs, sharks have been shown to use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Scientists were curious how bonnet-head sharks can swim roughly 1,000 miles in a straight line to a precise location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, known as White Shark Cafe, due to the abundance of bountiful aquatic lunch that can be found there, and then head home again without ever getting lost. Scientists weren't even aware this fish-rich zone existed until they tagged sharks and they led them there. By manipulating the magnetic field around a large water tank containing 20 bonnet-head sharks, researchers tricked the sharks into thinking they were 300 miles south of their Florida home. The sharks duly tried to swim north. When they changed the magnetic field so that it matched Florida, the sharks just milled around as they thought they'd already arrived home. What's really interesting was that when the researchers changed the magnetic location to 300 miles north, they behaved as though they didn't have a clue where they were, which stands to reason, I suppose, because they were in the middle of Tennessee. This implies they navigate using a map inside their heads, which they have to learn. It's highly likely other sharks do this as well, with great whites, for instance, traveling as much as 2,500 miles in straight lines across open seas. Unless they've learned to navigate by the stars, the only explanation is that they're using the Earth's magnetic field. Fact number three. Some sharks can only be aged through radiocarbon dating. Aging a shark is not a simple process. The first person to try to guess the age of a fish was Aristotle, around 300 BC. He noticed that fish scales get larger and tougher as fish age. But it wasn't until Antony van Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope in the mid-17th century that this was explored further. Fish scales were found to have growth rings like a tree trunk called annuli. They appear in fish bones as well, and counting the annuli in a fish's ear bones, or otoliths, has become the go-to way to check the age of a fish. But this doesn't work for sharks. Their skeletons are made of cartilage, which is much softer than bone. Their otoliths are no bigger than a grain of sand, and you can't use their scales to check their age, because they don't have any. Their skin is made up of dermal denticles, which are more like teeth than scales. Yeah, that's right, even the body of a shark is covered in goddamn teeth. They weren't already scary enough. So, for sharks, the only way to age them is via the vertebrae in their spines. Unfortunately, much like having to chop down a tree to check its age, you also have to stop a shark from aging by killing it first before you can check its age. Science can be cruel sometimes. So, for years we've been determining the age at which sharks died by sticking a slice of their vertebrae under the microscope and counting the annuli. There was some debate about whether annuli were annual after all, and they've subsequently found that annuli dating might only work accurately in young sharks because subsequent rings are created more slowly. So, many shark species could be significantly older than we first thought. But some shark's cartilage is too soft to create a nully at all. Greenland sharks, in particular, have been a scientific enigma for many years. They exist mainly in the Baffy Benthic zone of the Arctic Ocean, around two and a half miles below sea level. They're a similar size to great white sharks, but slow moving, pottering around at 0.7 miles an hour. They found fish, moose, and polar bear remains in their stomachs, but no one's actually seen them hunt. Little is known about their habitat, they're extremely elusive, and they weren't even captured live on film until 1995. Since then, marine biologists have managed to film them coming within 100 feet of the surface of the St. Lawrence estuary in Canada. 
but no one knows what for. I'd hazard a guess that's the only time they manage to eat moose. But one of the biggest puzzles about the Greenland shark has been its lifespan. Scientists reckoned they were long-lived, but no one knew how to measure it. That wasn't until radiocarbon dating was invented in 1946, which involves measuring the amount of naturally radioactive carbon-14 in a plant or animal. From radiocarbon dating 28 Greenland sharks in 2011 to 13, they estimated that the largest shark was around 392 years old, plus or minus 120 years, which is quite a range of uncertainty still. This means that even at the most conservative estimate, it is by far the oldest vertebrate in the world, at 272 years old. 61 years older than the next contender, a bowhead whale. And it could feasibly have been alive for more than 500 years. This shark could have been born as Leonardo da Vinci was putting the final touches to the Mona Lisa smile. Long before Elizabeth I became queen and a whole century before Shakespeare penned Hamlet. As an aside, they also calculated that Greenland sharks don't reach maturity till they're 156 years old. That's a lot of teenage angst to get through. <laughs> and that was Random Interesting Facts. Thank you for listening, and I'd absolutely love to hear your comments and suggestions for future episodes. And also be sure to like, review, and subscribe. And if you have your very own random interesting fact that you're just bursting to share with me, then tweet it using the hashtag RIFPODCAST, that's R-I-F PODCAST. Each week I'll choose my favourite fact from my lovely listeners and shout it out at the end of my next episode. And thanks again for listening. <laughs>